Welcome to the Future is Healthy podcast, where we have in-depth conversations with experts to help navigate wellness and empower all of us to make feasible changes to a healthier life and healthier world. In today's conversation, Daniel speaks with Dr. Uma Naidu, who is the world's first triple threat in the food and medicine space, a Harvard-trained psychiatrist, professional chef graduating with her culinary school's most coveted award, and a trained nutrition specialist. Her nexus of interests have found her niche in nutritional psychiatry. Dr. Naidu founded and directs the first hospital-based nutritional psychiatry service in the United States. She is the director of nutritional and lifestyle psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital and director of nutritional psychiatry at MGH Academy while serving on the faculty at Harvard Medical School. She is considered Harvard's mood food expert and has been featured in the Wall Street Journal. Today, her and Daniel discuss what led her to pursue culinary medicine. She talks about the intersection between foods, medicine, and mental health. She describes what the gut-brain connection is and how mood and food are related. Dr. Uma shares the staples in her diet that help protect mental health and her recommendations. That only scratches the surface of what her and Daniel cover in their conversation. I loved listening to this podcast, and we hope you do too. Now, on to the conversation. So what led you to pursue culinary training after becoming a doctor? You know, um, Julia Child was my food hero. And um, because I grew up in a large South Asian family, everyone else cooked. And so my mom, my grandmother, my, my older cousins, my aunts, they all cooked. And I was always tasting food and always around food. Um, but my mom taught me how to bake because she recognized early on that I loved science. So I arrived, uh, you know, later on in my life, uh, uh, especially when I was studying, but not really being able to cook. And my journey began uh, taking spices from home or my mom's recipes, my grandmother's recipes and trying them out on my own. And the companion on this journey that I had was public television and public television hosted Julia Child. Um, So, you know, being a young cook and not really knowing my way that well around the kitchen, but knowing tasty food, she was really a source of inspiration. So as I followed her life and career and understood that she was actually well known for her second career, which was the culinary arts. She had an entire career before that. I thought, you know, I love cooking so much and learning so much on my own. And from her, why not? I tried out myself. And I didn't expect that it would fit in um, so well with the rest of what I was doing. So that was a complete surprise. And I really did it because I I loved it so much and wanted to learn more. Uh, But it was also an ode to her. She was a, um, before she passed away, she was a patron at the school that I studied. So. That's amazing. So at the time you were a practicing psychiatrist and then you just decided to, uh, was it like night classes or did you totally put a pause on that and then do culinary Mm -hmm. and then come back? No, it it was, um, I basically made the decision based on, I sort of decided to look for an X amount of time that it takes me. I'm going to work extremely hard, take care of, you know, sleeping well, eating well and my health which is hard. It was very stressful, but I kind of spread out my schedule and made sure that I was taking you know, with my colleagues and my clinic that I was still taking care of my responsibilities as a doctor and um, went to school summer night classes and summer day classes, but I made it meld with my schedule. So honestly, when I think back, um, Dan, I must have really loved what I was doing because I, the years flew by and I was working super hard. When I think back, I'm not quite sure how I put it in, but I, I was very driven at the time and I was so um, passionate about it. You know, I, I really love cooking, love being around food. So I somehow made it work, but I know there was a very key moment when I figured, look, if I can move my schedule this way, cover enough of my colleagues that they could cover me on the days that I'm studying, then I could make it work. And we, you know, it, it, it was thinking back, I'm still not quite sure how it happened, but it did. And, and, and yeah, it was after I graduated and everything. So. 
That's impressive. And then to those listening, uh, it's probably even much harder than she's explaining. <laughs> um, <laughs> Comedy school is hard. <laughs> it is yeah. hard. It, it's drooling. It's drooling. But you know, the fun thing about it is when you when you love being around food and you love being around people and you love tasting food and you get into it, you just, you know, uh, I would be, my, my husband always says, you know, we'd be celebrating birthdays and I'd be with my, my I'd be taking my books around studying because it was the only way to like get up at six o'clock in the morning and write an exam, right? So you still celebrate birthdays, you still do everything else that you do with your family. So. And did you get a certain... Um satisfying feeling from cooking? Because I know with like psych- the practice of psychiatry, um, treatment may take a long time before you start to see results. Do you like that in culinary practices, you get that instant satisfaction of producing something good that tastes good and makes people feel good? Abs- absolutely. Um, I love that about food. And I love the fact that one of the challenges is that people think that they have to eat t- t- food that's not tasty if it's healthy. And I think that's one of the things I enjoy most, that there's still ways you can enjoy many, many delicious things. Um, and when you just simply teach someone or talk to someone about a recipe, it really, really brings it home for them. Um, and I think that that gap was missing in a lot of the conversations I was having with patients. But now I feel like I can make those recommendations um, and I can, you know, show them, refer them to a class I've done or something like that, which, which makes it makes the action step easier for them. You know, we interviewed Drew Ramsey, uh, Dr. Drew oh, Ramsey from yeah. Columbia, and I consider you two to be the two uh, most important nutritional psychiatrists uh, today. And I had asked him a question. I was like, hey, do you, as you're, you know, sitting here, do you feel this gigantic wave approaching you? A wave of the fact that, you know, mental health is coming to the forefront right now. And a lot of practices, a lot of ideas, a lot of people just are starting to understand that food is medicine and you're kind of standing there and you've got this giant wave of food is medicine coming in this giant wave of mental health coming to the forefront. And you're kind of standing right there in the middle and you're in such a perfect position, uh, where these two worlds are colliding. Um, do you feel, feel that, that sense and uh, that, that pressure and kind of just that excitement that's, that's like upon you? I'm actually very excited. I'm excited for a few different things. One is that um, I think that people are passionate about learning more um, through the lens of food. And for me, I feel as though um, starting the clinic that I did um, at Mass General in Boston has been you know, a, a step in the right direction. It's, it's really leading the movement around we can take food as medicine into mental health as well, not just in functional medicine, which, you know, they've really been doing this for a while. So it's lifestyle medicine, but psychiatry has not. So I think um, the fact that we, we are doing it out of an academic center makes it really strong. I also feel on a, you know, less happy note that COVID has really brought forth the problems, um, has really uncapped the problems in mental health because the problem with metabolic diseases, the underlying conditions and pre-existing conditions that led people to succumb from COVID and then those who have survived um, have also a larger percentage of mental health issues. All of that and the fact that we've had significant issues with emergency room um, emergency rooms being full and people needing treatment. I think there's this wave of how people are, you know, had to cope during COVID and the, almost the, um, the, the residual issues with mental health that are coming forth. So I think that needs to be addressed. And I think that if anything, food for me provides an easy conversation with people. Um, to really open uh, a more stigmatized area, which is me- mental health. So for me, it's, it's really a conversation starter. And, and that's how I use nutritional psychiatry. So um, I'm hoping that the emerging and continued evidence around the gut-brain connection and that work will just, will just really spiral us forward uh, to help more people. Can we talk a little bit about the gut brain connection for those listeners that, you know, maybe this is their first time hearing it. Could you explain that to them? Sure. So, you know, um, most people don't have conversations with their doctors about their, their necessarily the emotional health, but specifically about their brain. We talk about heart disease. We talk about, you know, 
cardiac disease, I'm sorry, if we talk about heart disease, type two diabetes, um, weight gain during COVID, but we're not really bringing the brain in the room. And it's really interesting because arguably without the brain, really the rest of us wouldn't function. So I feel that the gap that gets filled by nutritional psychiatry is that conversation around the gut brain connection, that ecosystem, and how that explains the food and mood connection. So the gut and brain are far apart in the body, but they arise from the exact same cells in the embryo um, and then divide up to form two different organs. Then they remain connected throughout life by the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve. I like to call the vagus nerve a two-way uh, superhighway because it's constantly communicating chemical messages back and forth in a bidirectional way. Um, but then when you add to that, that 90% or more of the serotonin receptors on the gut, um, as well as so, so much of serotonin, serotonin is produced there, we start to realize that um, there's, there is this emerging connection. So the way that I break down um, or unpack, I should say, how food is broken down then explains a little bit of how this interaction begins. The microbes of which there are about 39 odd trillion that reside in the gut microbiome, um, you know, are there to perform a function. When we eat healthy foods and, and healthier options, the breakdown products of the food we eat form healthier byproducts such as short chain fatty acids. And these microbes thrive on those products and byproducts. When we are eating fast food meals, ultra processed kind of junk foods, um, the bad microbes are fed. And when they thrive, um, is, that's when we start the setup for inflammation um, in the gut. How does this connect back to our mood and food? Well, the balance of, of the good microbes and their actions, the bad microbes and their actions are what keep that gut environment in sync and stable. When one overcomes the other, such as the bad microbes taking over, you get the setup for inflammation in the gut. Inflammation in the gut feeds back to inflammation in the brain. Um, and also inflammation is the first step towards things like leaky gut or intestinal permeability. And I think that, you know, just understanding that the gut-brain connection explains or unpacks a food mode connection is helpful for people to know that food is therefore a pretty powerful tool that they can use to their advantage. That's a beautiful and simple explanation of the gut brain connection. I appreciate that. Um, so you mentioned that it may affect inflammation in your brain. If you have a leaky gut, you have inflammation going on in your gut, that's going to lead to a inflamed brain. Um, we know that in psychiatry, there's not typically like lab values that you can measure. I mean, maybe you have like CRP or ESR, some things like that, that, that can measure inflammation, but, um, can you talk about how inflammation leads to certain things, certain mental conditions? Absolutely. So um, this, there's um, a lot of research being done around the fact that inflammation is now being considered the basis for several psychiatric diagnoses. So let's take Alzheimer's, for example. One of the things that's happened with Alzheimer's is that people are calling it type 3 diabetes because the risk factors for cardiac disease and type 2 diabetes are the same as for Alzheimer's. And if you really synthesize information down, it comes back to diet and lifestyle. Um, here's a good example of if you're eating poorly, if you're eating pro-inflammatory foods, such as processed, ultra-processed, highly sugared foods, artificial sweeteners, um, and uh, the wrong types of fats, you know, you are setting your gut up for the dysbiosis and inflammation. And this feeds back in a loop to the brain. So we want to think about it as, how can, we, how can we tweak our diets? How can we do even one thing right now today to move it in a healthier direction? None of us is perfect, including myself. So there might be something we're eating, a habit we've picked up during COVID. Um, I know, yeah, and I, I was a very unhealthy eater as a medical, medical student. I was always eating on the run, eating late at night, eating, uh, doing all the wrong things, breaking all the rules, you know? So I really think back to those days and realize that I, sh I should have been thinking about it differently. Um, but that being said, you know, we all learn, learn, learn at some point. And so um, I think it's about just finding even one or two things we can, we can start changing so that the aim is it's not an overnight change. It's not a quick fix that it becomes really set in your, into your lifestyle as a habit and it becomes how you live your life. Um, and that's really what I'm aiming for with my patients when I work with them. 
And when you, you know, you talk about these, your gut microbiome kind of trending upwards or trending downwards, um, when it's trending upwards and does that make your gut just more resilient, uh, to infection, inflammation, whatever it may be, does it get more and more resilient over time? The, I think the way that I think about it is that if we are continuing to pursue a healthier diet over time, usually research has shown that in about, if, if you need to have some gut healing done, if for whatever reason, um, from stress to uh, mental health issues, to poor dietary changes, whatever it is that's causing the stress and impacting gut microbiome research has shown that usually gut healing when we make adjustments in our diet takes about 28 days to a month. And I do see that in my practice. So I will tell you people after a week of feeling better and doing the right thing will start to feel great. But actual, you know, if you look at it on a more cellular level, I think that it, it research has consistently shown it takes a little bit longer. But that being said, it's, it's always great when someone starts to feel better because here's the thing, they feel motivated to do more. And that's a very important thing to tap into. Um, so, I, you know, that's, that's sort of how I think about it and uh, allow people to, to implement sort of one step at a time until they feel comfortable putting it together in, in a, in a plan that works, that works for them. That's amazing. And it's, it's so cool that you actually have a nutritional psychiatry practice, um, for, you know, for our listeners that that's the first time they're even hearing about the field nutritional psychiatry. Um, can you just give us an idea of what it may look like start to finish when a patient comes and sees you? Sure. So nutritional psychiatry is the use of healthy whole foods and nutrients based on the scientific evidence to improve your mental well-being. And it does not exclude the use of therapy or medications, many of which have been life-saving uh, for, my, uh, for patients in my psychiatric practice. So, you know, many people who seek out my help um, are really looking for additional tools in the toolkit to feel emotionally healthy. Some of them are maybe on medications. Some of them may have experienced or be experiencing side effects from medications such as weight gain. Um, others are sort of have new onset of symptoms and are wondering, you know, can I use nutritional strategies? And each person is individual because our gut microbiome is like a thumbprint. So one person's treatment plan in nutritional psychiatry is seldom going to be the same as someone else. When they, you know, I have them fill in certain questionnaires and provide some information and some screening upfront so that we know what we need to do when I meet with them. And that makes the time more efficient. Um, I, a, a thorough history is where I start. I really want to know what's going on with them. If they, they are being referred to me from whether it's an orthopedic surgeon to a gastroenterologist to an infectious disease specialist. I am reviewing labs, collaborating with those doctors to see what needs to be done. And then evaluate the person who comes, you know, and sits with me before COVID or online now um, to see, do they need further testing? Are they, are they lacking based on their diet and what they're eating? Are they maybe lacking certain vitamins? Are they say, could they potentially have a need for B, vitamin B12 if they're vegan? Um, could they be you know, missing out on, on enough fiber in their diet just from plant foods if they say are uh, following a carnivore diet? So it just depends on what, what they're eating and then fine tuning what the assessments need to be and what we need to do from there. That's great. Um, so you, you talk about some of the foods that you may add, uh, for example, if someone's on a carnivore diet, you may need to add, um, you know, B12, something like that. But what, are there any big, um, uh, things that you need to immediately take away from these people's diets or is, what are some of the big, uh, no, no's that you see? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, with, with carnivore diet, they're getting enough vitamin B12 because it's found in meat products. Um, but it's usually vegans that we, we want at least check level test on guess, you know, check the level, see if they need it. Um, so a lot of the time it's, it's cleaning up the diet. And I say that without judgment because no one's diet is perfect, but it's very often that people don't realize the hidden sugars and things that they're having. They're getting a 20 ounce cup of coffee in the morning. They're not realizing that, you know, they're counting it as virtually no calories, but they're putting a ton of stuff in it. That's, you know, loaded with, I would say empty calories or they grabbing a donut or a bagel on the way to work and they're not thinking about that because it's an easy food to get. It seems like a healthy option or an easy option, I should say. 
So it's from, you know, tweaking out where the added uh, refined sugars are hidden. Someone who's eating yogurt thinks, well, Dr. Naidu said blueberries are great. I'm going to get a blueberry yogurt. But, you know, when you look at a half, half cup container, it has about six to eight teaspoons of added sugars because the fruited yogurts are not the way to go. So replacing that with a plain yogurt, adding berries and cinnamon, much better way to go. So it's really finding, finding in, in, in someone who is eating a certain way where they could make even slight tweaks that could be uh, could improve what they're doing. So added sugars, looking for the trans fats, the um, you know the the wrong types of fats in their diet, processed vegetable oils, um, understanding that processed vegetable oils are pro-inflammatory. Um, you know, looking for maybe they're trying to cut back on sugar and they move to a diet soda. And then they're getting a load of artificial sweeteners that they don't realize. So it's it's looking specifically for those uh, for those things. Wow, those are some good tips. Yeah, sugar. It's really hard to find anything at a grocery store that doesn't have sugar in it. Doesn't have sugar. It's really <laughs> difficult. <laughs> it, it, it's really true. It's sort of you know the way to think about these the process. Look, it's hard in our lifestyle with our lifestyles not to uh, come in contact with the processed food or packaged mm -hmm. food, but it's the kind. It's it's you know. Um, if it, you know, if it has an expiration date, it, it probably is not the best option for you because think about an orange or banana or lettuce or cabbage, you know, it doesn't have an expiration date, you either buy it and use it, or, you know, it's, it's not going to be labeled a certain way. It's not going to be there, there at Christmas, let's say. So um, I think that that's, that's helpful. And then just understanding a gradient list and what they contain. So you can, we can tweak and make some better options for yourself. Have you found that it's hard to convince people that good food can help our mood? Um, just because I, you know, I, it's from personal experience, I didn't know how I was actually feeling. I didn't know what it meant like to actually feel good. Um, until I cleaned up my diet about two years ago. Um, mm -hmm. and I took sugar out and, you know, I went through mm -hmm. sugar withdrawals. I was having nightmare, wow. extensive mm -hmm. dreams about sugar. Like, you know, even yeah. just my dream, I'm like going through grocery stores, looking for sugar. Um, wow. and my diet was relatively clean, um, hmm. going into that, but now wow. I have, you know, a little bit of sugar and I can actually feel my brain, like, you know, like almost like a tension right. headache or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've kind of found, you know, just talking with friends and family and maybe even some patients sometimes that they don't know what it actually feels like, uh, to not feel inflamed. Uh, do you have, how do you, you know, give your elevator pitch to people that, um, you know, I saw this on your website, good food for good moods. Uh, right. How do you right. explain that to them? Right. Well, you know, part of it, um, Dan, is, is I, I liken this to someone who, um, you know, who during COVID may have been, have, may have started drinking one too many glasses of wine. They, they have got to reach a point where either family member, a friend, or they realize, you know what, that's two, two empty bottles of wine in my uh, recycle bin what's going on. They've, they've got to, it's got, it's got to kind of hit home and they've got to, it has to come from within that they want to make a change. So honestly, I would be wasting my breath in an elevator pitch if someone was, uh, you know, eating a donut and happy and, and doing that because they would, they would want, they, they would have to recognize it as an issue, right? It's a simple carb. It's being digested in two seconds. It's spiking your insulin, your blood sugar is getting, going up. You're going to be hungry in 10 minutes and looking for another one or something else. So it, it's, um, it's hard to convince people. And I think the people, I would say the people who really seek this type of care are those that have recognized like yourself, um, that there's something I'm doing. I'm, I have a relatively clean diet, but something's not quite right. And I want to, I want to look deep into this. It's, it's much harder to say to the, to a person who, who has a, you know, the standard American diet, um, that, Hey, you need to do this and do that because I found in my clinical practice that doesn't work. Someone has got to want to make a change for it to really, uh, have an impact and um, it doesn't always work. There are some people who, uh, you know, have a condition called orthorexia and they're very fixated on really certain um, healthy habits that go to an extreme. And sometimes it's very hard to work with them because it, 
it, it takes a lot of convincing to say, well, you need to eat a little bit more of this to have a balanced diet. So it's, it's, it's not perfect, uh, but I'm, I'm fortunate to say that more, more times than less, uh, there's some success that patients see and feel. I think my elevator pitch would just be to give friends and family your book, uh, which I read <laughs> last you. year. That's so you, kind. Yeah, that your so book kind. is called This Is Your Brain on Food. Uh, is I actually read it during the pandemic. We had finally had a little bit of time off from medical school. Yeah. And it was wow. actually one of the first books I got. I believe I got it on Audible. It was great. It just made me think about, you know, this is kind of around the time when I cut out sugar and just really thought wow. about like, hey, here's my chance. I have a little bit of a break from medical school. <laughs> let's take this diet and nutrition Amazing. thing seriously. Um, so, so thank you for the book. It was, it's oh, that's awesome. amazing. I'm work. so happy to hear that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so for people that are now convinced that their food is going to impact their mood, um, what's, what do you recommend them to eat? If someone was to go to the grocery store with you, what, what do you always get? What do you always put in your, your shopping cart? Absolutely. So my staples um, are usually uh, a plant-rich diet, uh, clean sources of protein, um, healthy whole grains, and healthy fats. So, so the basic food groups. I love the produce section. It's where I hang out the most. Um, and I balance uh, you know, what I buy in terms of organic versus non-organic based on the EWG's uh, list of either the dirty dozen or the clean 15. I love cruciferous vegetables because they're rich in sulfurophane. Um, great antioxidant for our brain and for our gut. So cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Then I love all the leafy greens, uh, the greener, the better. And I love to switch it up and entertain myself each week by just making different uh, combinations of greens in my salad. Um, folate is, low folate is associated with depression. So it's a great way to just bulk up on those leafy greens, make a basis for great salad. Then I go for color in the vegetable section. So I love, you know, sweet bell peppers, red peppers um, have some of the highest levels of vitamin C, um, a great one. I love blueberries and sometimes I get blueberries frozen, if, especially if I see wild frozen blueberries because they have twice the amount of antioxidants and blueberries tend to be fragile. So if I want a large amount, um, you know, I get the frozen and I, I defrost them or just put them onto my yogurt or whatever I'm eating. Uh, I love, um, so I, I do hang out there and uh, I also stock up on my prebiotics, which are the allium family, garlic, leeks, onions, because I'll do soups or I'll, you know, do stir fries or roasted veggies and all of that comes in handy. Um, then I like to get either um, grass bulk dairy or uh, coconut versions of yogurt for the probiotics. Um, I love things like kimchi, miso. By the way, you know, when you're looking at fermented foods, sauerkraut, miso, sorry, sauerkraut, uh, miso, uh, kimchi, look in the frozen, uh, not frozen, refrigerated section, because you want the live active cultures from those. Um, and then, you know, I like the center aisles for the legumes, the beans, some members of my, I'm, I have, happen to be a raised vegetarian. So that's what I'm used to eating. I cook anything. Um, but some members of my family are not vegetarian. So if, you know, if, if the, uh, if salmon is, if I see wild uh, sockeye salmon, I'll get a piece of that. Um, and, you know, if I see good non-GMO organic tofu, I'll get some of that. I also love legumes, beans um, for sources of protein. They're also relatively inexpensive for people. And that's kind of, you know, I, I found that over time, I'm just not really that into the ice cream aisle and the, the frozen dinners and, you know, things that um, I, I sort of, I guess over time um, have, have understood that those are not the foods I want to eat because when I do come upon them, say I'm traveling or unexpectedly um, have to eat something that way, it's, it's kind of like you and when you have, you know, ate some sugar again. Uh, I'm not, you know, I, I can always correct at the next meal, but I notice a change in how I'm feeling, which I call body intelligence. I just feel different when that happens. Um, so I try, I try to eat clean, but it's not perfect. Really not perfect. A lot of good examples there. And just to mention to our audience, she had mentioned the dirty dozen and the clean 15, um, to know what to purchase organic and what you don't have to. We did some TikToks on those a while back, um, which we will link in the show notes. Um, Great. But yes, uh, you mentioned, you know, you, over time, you eventually don't want to make those de decisions. 
about eating bad food. Um, even if you crave them, I know I must admit a few months ago, I went to get a huge thing of gelato cause I was just craving some sugar. I think I'd yeah. worked a long day. Yeah. Um, and then I got it, ate the whole tub. And then I just felt mm-hmm. so sick. My head was pounding. I fell asleep yeah. early. The next day was messed up. And then a few days ago, I kind of had that same feeling at the grocery store, yeah. walking by the ice cream aisle. Yeah. And then I was like, Oh, I should do it again. But then you weigh, you, you weigh the, you know, the outcomes and it's the like, feeling. okay, yeah. five minutes of feeling good. And the dopamine right. rush of having some sugar versus right. the 12 hour, <laughs> uh, jet not lag feeling not so good. It. Yeah, right. exactly. I, it happens to, to any one of us, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to, to sort of, um, and that's why this is a lifestyle and not um, an all or none sort of situation in terms of how I want to work with people. It's it's really about making better choices more often than not. You know, there's the time you'll pick up the tub and there's the time that you have the fortitude to say, hey, you know what, I'm not going to feel good. So I'll, I'll skip it this time. Um, and I think it's about finding finding that finding that balance and, and learning how to make banana ice cream from my book, which is based on bananas. Ooh. And you can even make a chocolate flavor. So did you, did you get the Audible or the Kindle? Um, the Audible. Okay. Yeah. So depending on where you got it from, the recipe is on a PDF. So. Okay. I think, I think most of the time when you purchase the Audible, you have access to the PDF. Um, okay. So okay. I'll need to do that. Banana ice cream. Sounds yeah, pretty so good. it's it's really it's it's a real something you should try. And if you like chocolate, you just add in um, natural uh, cacao powder, uh, uh, extra dark, and you get great chocolate flavor. So nice. pretty easy. Do you ever have like a morning smoothie or anything like that where you just throw all you the know, good once stuff? In a while. In? Once in a while, if I'm I, I'm not a I'm not a huge smoothie fan just because. I, I kind of enjoy eating something mm-hmm. that's just me, but if I'm stuck, if I'm traveling, uh, those are, those are, that's a good option for me. Uh, but I don't depend on that as much as I do meal prep and having a uh, little breakfasts ready, you know, things to go salads pre-prepared so I can put them together, um, between, you know, between my calls and stuff like that. I know a lot of our listeners are, you know, they, they, are between the ages, mostly between 25 and 35. That's our biggest age group, um, that follow us and watch our content. And so I know a lot of them are either, you know, in in school or they're working professionals. So their mornings are always running behind. Uh, what kind of breakfast do you recommend? Is there any tips that you give your patients that are in that similar scenario? Absolutely. So I think what, what you first need to do it just figure out a two hour time frame in your week. It could be any two hours that suit you. It could be midnight, it could be Sunday afternoon to meal prep. So it could be the day that you do your supermarketing or in some instances getting your groceries delivered and some great ideas for breakfast are chia pudding um, because it has coconut milk, chia seeds, rich in protein and fiber and short chain omega threes. Um, and you can sweeten it with things like vanilla you can sprinkle on cinnamon, and if, you, and if you want, you can add a touch of manuka honey. You can prep them into little containers. They set like a gel, and uh, they are very easy to keep. So you can make a week at a time and have an easy on-the-go breakfast. Say you commute or you know, you, you're studying like yourself and have to get into classes. Another one is frittata. So if you eat eggs, um, you know, look for pastured eggs, uh, omega-3 rich eggs, these are good sources for you. Um, you just make a large, it's like you, you're making a large omelet, but what I love to use is a cupcake pan. And you make mini frittatas, you bake them up on the weekend or whichever day you're meal prepping, and you keep one a couple for the next two days and you freeze the rest in individual um, I like the reusable bags that you can freeze and you, you just take one in the morning to work. You can always pop it in the microwave for 10 seconds at work um, and eat it, eat it that way or it might thaw by the time you get to work. So, so these are at least two that you can start. Overnight oats is another one. Um, again, you can make these overnight and it will last you for the week ahead. Um, so those are some of my favorite go-tos and I add in, you know, crunchy, um, I like to take a snack of, um, a small amount of, uh, just raw natural nuts would say extra, extra dark chocolate chips because all healthy brain ingredients right there 
healthy fats, uh, selenium if you have Brazil nuts, um, you know, short chain omegas from walnuts, little packet, you know, we're talking two tablespoons, quite a cup, um, and just in your pocket, in your backpack, in your bag, so that, you know, you, you're not reaching for a vending machine or a fast food place. It just it will give you that. And then a water bottle. That's the other thing, a sustainable water bottle or something. You just you just need to keep yourself hydrated as well. So that's <laughs> breakfast, but there are lots of, lots of meals I can think of. <laughs> it's fascinating that having just a small handful of nuts or almonds, whatever it may be, really keep you full for a long time. They do. They do. Yeah. And the thing is, the reason to measure it out is they're tasty. And if you have the whole bag with you, you're going to be tempted. It's happened to me. You're going to be just, you don't even realize you're working on the laptop or you're commuting and you just, so if you just portion them out, that actually is very satiating. You have that with water, you take a piece of fruit, an apple, a small clementine, you know, it's just a way to negotiate and negotiate the day. And um, the other thing I like to do is a uh, vegetable forward kind of plant rich uh, either stir fries or scrambles or um, roasted veggies because they can be pretty nutritious great side dish addition to a salad if you make a side of salmon for dinner you can have those on the side so these are easy ways to kind of make sure you have things in motion so then you get home at the end of a busy day you have something partially prepared and it feels less stressful I like that. Yeah. It does feel less stressful when you have something planned and you don't kind of, uh, you don't wait till you're hungry to let your, you right. know, your hypoglycemia <laughs> dictate what you're going to eat. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cause that usually it happens to all of us. It leads you to a fast food restaurant or the gelato that may not make you feel great. Um, you know, or, or whatever it is that you might be craving for someone else. It could be, you know, um, um, you know, a chicken fast food place, whatever it is. So. So, so you've mentioned folate being related um, to, some, to some mental processes, and you also mentioned omegas briefly. Do you ever recommend supplementation or do you just recommend trying to get as much as you can from your diet? No, I do need one, one should try with diet, but here's the thing. Our lives are not perfect. Uh, we're facing, you know, environmental stress, um, pollution, um, you know, pandemic, so many things. It's, 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 there's no issue with, with supplementing. I just, what I feel is people, just like you can't exercise out of a bad diet, you can't supplement your way out of a bad diet. So if you're eating um, Cheetos and, and fast foods every day, um, you can't supplement with something and think you, your gut microbiome is going to be in the right place and you're going to be lacking inflammation in your body. So you sort of have to slowly one by one clean up things and add in supplements that, you know, if you prefer an omega-3 supplement because maybe you don't like seafood, maybe you're vegan, there are algal oil supplements um, for omega. So, you know, you can, you can find ways to do it. You can't out supplement a bad diet. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Yeah, that that's, I agree with you in terms of, uh, supplementation, uh, Amanda and I are working with a organization called food fix. It's with Mark Hyman and Tufts school of medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's all about regenerative agriculture and using food as medicine. So we're trying to convince awesome. and educate Congress members. Um, and so we're working with them so we can create educational content that, you know, staff members can take to Congress members and teach them and educate them on, uh, regenerative organic practices and what that can do for our climate, what that can do for our health. And hopefully we can build our soil up again and, mm -hmm. and get some healthy, amazing. nutritious food again. That's amazing. So, um, yeah, I completely agree with you. A few other things that I wanted to talk about, but you know, you had mentioned that COVID had kind of unveiled this mental health crisis. Um, has there been an increase in things like depression and anxiety, or is it just that, that it's now coming to the surface? You know, I think it's, it's uh, almost a combination of both. Um, I feel that conditions in mental health may not have been coming to the forefront before COVID, but COVID has sort of pushed them to the forefront. But separate to that, another process that has been going on is that there's been a huge uptick in, in, in individuals um, accepting or requesting or being prescribed medications for new onset of conditions like anxiety, depression, and insomnia. And a survey in spring of 2020 showed that there were several people with new prescriptions for the uh, 
uh, for um, anxiety, depression, and insomnia. So much so that people are calling insomnia now coronasomnia. So the other factor is that Zoloft went on shortage in June of 2020, first time in my career, and showing that, you know, it was a pretty popular medication and a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor used for anxiety, depression, several conditions, but one that uh, went on shortage in the US. So it, it, was, it was, these different trends were just showing and reflecting the uptick of, of mental health issues. Then in um, June, the CDC released some data showing that 11% uh, of Americans had thought, had thought and were thinking of suicide. Um, there's been a huge uh, increase in teen suicide and teens thinking about suicide. So a lot of things have emerged. And then we also know that the rates of trauma, uh, because people were confined in quarantine with potentially people who are abusive, were on the rise and increased, and substance use increased. So, you know, almost across the board, there were just massive, massive increases in different things coming to the forefront. Um, and so I feel that, you know, uh, not only COVID itself, the actual pandemic, but how things unfolded and the conditions around uh, the pandemic, which were necessary for our safety, also uh, could have driven certain mental health conditions. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. I, so I was interested in cancer for a while and, and the topic and the molecular biology of cancer, mm -hmm. because I was in graduate school, I was kind of told that, you know, once we solve heart disease, once we solve things like hypertension, diabetes, all that's left is cancer. And mm. that's what, you know, the older we live, the more people are exposed to things like cancer, but I kind of think it's more so true of mental health. Like the longer mm -hmm. we live, the more advanced we get technologically and mm -hmm. scientifically, it's always going to be mental health. Uh, I, I feel like mental health is always going to be there. It's just a yeah. case of whether people talk about it or not. And, um, and I think that and one of the things I care deeply about is destigmatizing mental health. And that's where the conversation on food is helpful because I feel that people are just, just feel very ashamed to not only ask for help, but to share that they are suffering in a certain way. So, you know, I think it's, um, it's just, uh, it's an area that I think we as a country, as a nation, just need to be more comfortable with that conversation uh, and genuinely helping people around when they ask for help. You know. Is that why you started using social media? You know, um, yes, yes, uh, yes, that was part of the reason. My move to social media was very unusual because I'd had, I think, some personal accounts that I barely used, except for sharing family photographs. Um, and then the pandemic hit, and I'd spent all this time writing my book. So it was a little bit devastating to be a debut author and have no book signings and no one to share it with and <laughs> no one who knew. So this, this took me to social media and we found, you know, it was fun on Instagram. We sort of started talking about my book. Um, I say we because I have a team, a small team of uh, wonderful people who work with me, but we started really taking the content from my book and messaging it. Um, and it ended up, so far being, I hope, a positive, positive platform for educational uh, information and um, learning uh, just about mental health, destigmatizing mental health. That's really what took me to Instagram. And then we, then we um, share across the platforms. But Dan, I'm not yet on TikTok. I'm small on TikTok, but I, but I, but I definitely want to hang out there with you. Yeah, we're going to work on that. Uh, we have for the listeners, uh, we we have something in the works. We'll, we'll put a post out soon and then hopefully we can send our, you know, million and a half people your way. And so you could share your message there. Cause awesome. you know, when I go on Instagram, um, I always feel kind of bad when I go on Instagram, just cause I know, you know, it's kind of it can be toxic, but when I'm scrolling through my feed, uh, you know, it's usually, you know, during a break at work and I'm kind of hungry and I always, you know, I start to have these thoughts about what I'm going to eat. And then I always yeah. get a reminder from you or uh, <laughs> one of the other doctors, sometimes Drew Ramsey, I get like a eat healthy because of X, Y, and Z reason. And I'm always just like, okay, I'll just wait. <laughs> so I appreciate that. And I think what you're doing Thank is you. excellent. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. And, um, 
I, I thank you because, you know, I feel like what y'all are doing and using positive messaging on things, places like TikTok is super important for people just to have well vetted voices that are sharing good information that is useful to them. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we appreciate that. We think, you know, we love any time that health professionals are on there because uh, especially with misinformation, we don't need to necessarily silence people. We just need to empower the right people right. to go out there and exactly. be savvy with social media. So anytime we can help, we're happy to do so, especially with people that we look up to like yourself. Well, thank you. And, and I like how you frame that because it's not about telling someone else that they shouldn't or shouldn't, should say something. People are going to do what they're going to do. You know that. And I know that mm -hmm. it's not for us to, to police them. Right. But it's how do we empower people to get the right information or the well vetted information? Mm -hmm. The people listening to me don't always agree with me, but at least I'm sharing my opinion. And all I ask for my Instagram page and my social media is be respectful. Mm -hmm. You can disagree with me, but we don't tolerate trolls. We don't tolerate people who are rude because it's not necessary. You know, it's just, we, we're trying to create a culture and an environment of, helping one another. Um, and if, if that's not what you want, then you probably don't <laughs> belong visiting us, you know, I like that shut down the trolls. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, you know, people on social media, they know how to find the right information. And if you are, you know, a verified person, you you've done the research, you're putting out good quality information. The consumer knows how to find that and they will find yeah. it. If they, if they have the option yeah. of picking something good or picking something bad, they'll pick the good thing. I strongly believe I that. I always hope so. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I definitely, definitely have had good feedback on my page and I'm very grateful for that. Um, that's great. Uh, I've seen on your page and across your website um, and in your book, you have an acronym called brain foods. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain what that is? So, you know, one of the, one of the things, well, I don't need to say this to you, then, but you know, everything in medical school is how do you get through it without creating yeah. acronyms? And one of my favorite things still to do. So when, when I was writing my book, I wondered, you know, how can I synthesize this in a way that someone could pick up the hardcover, you know, flip through it, take even snapshots or make lists from the book of things that are going to make a difference to them. And they may be very simple, but they're very powerful. So I just broke down the, the actual brain foods, you know, play on uh, the title of my book, This Is Your Brain on Food, into the foods that you really should be trying to choose in your daily diet, in your weekly diet, and how to incorporate that. So it's really intended for people to kind of keep at the tip of their fingers when they're grocery shopping, when they're shopping online for food, um, when they're driving home after a busy shift, you know, thinking, what, you know, what are the things I can pick up on the way? What are the things I can order? What are the things I can buy? That's great. Um, the last little section, I have a few more questions. Um, some of these are personal because I'm interested in the field of psychiatry. Um, but one thing that interests me about psychiatry is the future is kind of unwritten. Uh, the, it seems like the field kind of has, it's got some room to grow. It's got some room to evolve. Um, where do you see the future of psychiatry? You know, it's a hard one for me because um, I was just seeing recently that DSM-5 is, is the DSM-5-TR is on the horizon. And I um, really don't feel that DSM-5 covers what we see as clinicians in mental, in mental illness and in clinics and, and in everyday life. Many people just don't fit into a checkbox of lists. And many people are suffering, having a few symptoms from here and a few symptoms from there. Um, I use nutritional psychiatry to fill those gaps um, in order to help people. So I'm, you know, and I feel that we, we sadly lacking any kind of a tissue diagnosis. So it becomes um, harder to pinpoint um, diagnoses and, and how to help people. I also think that we lean heavily on medications. I have nothing against them. I still prescribe medications. Medications have saved the lives of many of my patients, but they come with side effects. So my practice has evolved to be uh, based on my cultural background, my studies, um, an integrated functional and uh, holistic approach to psychiatry, because I don't think you can do it another way. You know, you, you, you cannot, you just, you, you cannot exclude nutrition, you cannot exclude lifestyle factors, and you cannot ignore the mind-body connection and things like mindfulness or meditation and that type of thing. So I feel like all of that becomes important. Um, I feel that the one hope we have, and I don't know that, that 
uh, I feel like I'm an early adopter, I don't know if others will follow, is that we can truly lean into the research and the gut-brain connection and the gut microbiome to see whether there's a role for psychobiotics um, and other potentials for intervention um, in mental health with the gut microbiome. And I think that there is a powerful area that I hope uh, that I hope I hope we also go in, but you know I can't say that um, I, I kind of feel alone in that quest. But that's okay. Uh, I'm okay with that. We support you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate um, that. Do you feel like a lot of these issues can be fought? You know, when you're talking about nutritional psychiatry and these type of treatments, do you feel like a lot of these can be kind of fought upstream in terms of you know fixing our agricultural system? You know, fixing our 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 diets and schools and cafeterias at an early age? Absolutely. I think that if we were to take on all of these things, it's, it's very hard to reverse industrialization of crops, right? You in you, regenerative farming is certainly worthwhile. Um, the work that you're doing um, with, with um, Mark Hyman and, and Tufts, excellent. Um, you know, we have a task force at the Harvard Tate School of Public Health. We're also trying to make and actually had a hearing with senators last thing was was last year. Um, you know, everyone everyone aiming to to work together is what's important. Um, how to change all of these things? I think that we we have to have a, a number of people that are willing to take it on. You can't reverse industrialized farming, but you can teach people how to eat better. You, you can talk about school programming and better school meals. We can feed cardiac and other patients, including psychiatric patients, better meals that are more based on nutrition than they are on whatever, whatever formula seems, seems to be happening in hospitals. There's a study um, on prisoners where they improved the, um, the diet and it showed that the levels of aggression decreased when they cleaned up the diet. So, you know, there's, there's, um, there's a lot of evidence to say that we should be doing that. And I think what we need is a mass of people to get behind a movement to really start to steer this in the right direction. So I absolutely think that things will change if, if, if we could implement change at those levels. That's good. Yeah. That study, that's so interesting. That violence went down like that. And I, did they also in that study do that in an elementary school or some type of school? No, I, I haven't seen the one in the elementary school, but I can look for it. Uh, but I did, I did see the one in the, um, you know, in, in prison, which I thought, oh, wow, that was, that was, you know, such an environment of hostility in, in many instances and, um, you know, just how difficult it could be. So I thought that was good. Yeah. So lastly, this is the future is healthy podcast by medicine explained. So we ask every guest to finish the following sentence. The future is blank. The future is hopeful because of the ongoing research in the gut microbiome that I think will unfold some very powerful tools in the treatment of mental illness. Um, you mentioned, that's a great answer. You mentioned briefly earlier about, uh, did, was it biopsychotics or psychobiotics? Psychobiotics, yeah. Okay, and if you if you could take a peek into the future, what would that look like? I think that that the the research um, in different you know microbiome companies is basically trying to find interventions to manipulation of the gut microbiome. So these may actually be products that either can be um, designed or or used. Um, in a way that is not a prescription medication, but what's unclear to me right now is how it can be rolled out. Um, right now, I think it's more almost in the supplement space, but that being said, you know, we, supplements in this country are a billion dollar industry. So I think there's a place for them. And, and I think that uh, responsible companies are doing some really great responsible work around that. So, you know, no one is saying that you're, you're actively suicidal, manic, psychotic, um, or struggling that you should be, you know, eating folate rich greens first. You can always adjust your diet, but you know, in those instances, emergency care, emergency room care, um, seeing your doctor becomes urgent, right? But we are saying that food can always be part of that conversation. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Future is Healthy podcast.
If you loved what you heard, subscribe on wherever you get your podcasts. And if you think someone you know can benefit from any of the info we talked about, share this with friends and family and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. We don't rely on paid ads so that you can trust we have no conflict of interest in any of the information we provide or talk about in this podcast. If you support what we're doing, you can help us to continue putting out content by clicking the link to support the Future is Healthy podcast. This podcast is for general education purposes only. It is not a substitute for treatment, diagnoses, or professional medical advice. It does not constitute the practice of medicine or other qualified professional health care services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information from this podcast and any of the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. If you are seeking advice for any medical condition, it is important to seek the assistance from a qualified, trained, and licensed medical practitioner.